The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. So Eric started talking to me about this talk last fall. And I put him off and I said I didn't have time. And then he got back to me and said, how about January something? I said, no way. He said, how about something or other? I said, no way. Finally, he said, how about February 19th? I said, fine, February 19th. Hello? Oh, no. This is not good. I don't like to be tethered up here, but that's the way it appears to be. Not even this is working. Yeah. Not responding. Hmm. I was supposed to buy a new computer a, a while ago. Ah, there we go. Okay, so then February 19th, I started thinking about this. <laughs> I, I was going to play this off as like a. a a little lesson to you undergrad and grad students about how to manage time, but really this is just whining. Um, February 19th, I started realizing what all is going on in February. First, some of you know I've got a son that skis, and in about a week and a half's time, he skis a conference meet, sections meet, hopefully state meet, and he did qualify for that state meet, so we've been running all over the state of Minnesota. He's also doing junior nationals, and his last two races were this weekend, so that's where I spent my time out on the ski course this weekend. Then there's a matter of my own pitiful skiing, and I'm going to go up to the Berkey this weekend. Um, any of you watching the Olympics? You know, in our house, one or the other of us, much to my wife's disgust, will turn it on. And then we're like moths around a candle. We don't get anything done for the rest of the night but watch Olympics. So four years from now, Eric, don't call me in February. I know I should have. I just don't think. You would have thought about this. Jim Luby would have thought of this. I didn't. Yeah. yeah. Figure skating. Oh, curling. Curling. No. OK, so that's the whining. Um, today's menu, briefest of backgrounds, a little bit of history. There may be some people in here that don't know about the program, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Widely, I bifurcate the program when we do breeding, and then we do the supporting research. That would be genetics, generally physiology, and those are often graduate student projects that kind of support our breeding work, and those generally genetics and physiology. And then we're going to start dabbling a little bit in plant conservation here, which is kind of exciting, and I'll talk about that. I couldn't think what kind of picture to put on this slide, and finally I had an inspiration this morning, and I decided to put Dr. Leon Snyder here. Some of you know he was a former chair of the department here. He was the first director of the Landscape Arboretum. He really was the one that initiated this Woody Landscape Plant Breeding Program. Um, he's a fellow Michigander, um, which I learned subsequently. The other interesting thing about Snyder that I didn't realize till I was here for a few years is he was a co-author on my introductory genetics textbook. And I think that's a little known fact about him. I tried to give the Arboretum that textbook to include in the Snyder collection. They didn't even want it. But I thought that was really notable. OK. So the history. The project was initiated in 1954, as Hannah said. That's very good that you dredged that up somewhere and remembered that. Um, the objective to expand the palette of cold hardy woody landscape plants for the upper Midwest landscapes. And oftentimes what we'll see when we bring novel, interesting kinds of things in is something like this. Plants that get fried at some point in their course of development in our landscape. So we're trying to avoid that kind of thing. In 60 years, the project's been responsible for at least a 54 woody landscape plants. That's a little um, loose, but um, for a lot of plants. Includes seven large statured shade trees. Um, one of the more recent ones was Firefall Freeman Maple, which was released in 2000. Um, well, 2001, 2005 is what's in the extension bulletins. There's a difference between the time we get the permission to release it and when it becomes available to the public, so that gets kind of weird um, talking about exactly when they're introduced. Also, eight smaller statured flowering trees, the most notable being the Minnesota strain of um, eastern redbud. This is a neat picture Dave Hansen took up at the Medtronic corporate headquarters. And I'll come back to this in a few minutes, so keep that image of that tree in mind. 
Nine shrubs, several of those are dogwoods and we're kind of famous for shrub dogwoods. I think this is the neatest of them all, um, garden glow dogwood. It's got this kind of chartreuse colored foliage that really looks nice in a shade. It maintains that color in the shade. It's kind of a nifty plant to have in that part of the landscape. Includes a vine. This was kind of a, a new thing. We released this American Wisteria Summer Cascade that came out a couple of years ago. Nice, new, interesting plant for our upper Midwest landscapes. This is an example of a plant that's out of its range. I could talk for half of the seminar just about this, but it had its beginnings in Cairo, Illinois, Southern Illinois. Includes 11 roses, the most recent being Suddenly Summer, Summer Waltz, pictured here, released in 2011. This was a novel introduction for us. Um, we did this uh, in conjunction with the Arboretum. So we had a naming contest at the Arboretum. We gave prizes for the winning name. Um, and it's sold exclusively through the Arb Auxiliary at their annual plant sale and also at the garden store out there at the Arboretum. So that's a real different way for us to put a plant into market. This picture was taken at East Cliff. Those plants have been there for, boy, just a year or two after I got here. They picked that one as um, a rose they wanted in, in that landscape. We're most well known for the light series of deciduous azaleas, and there are now 16 of those that have come out, including this um, compact red flowered azalea. People have waited for that for a long time. Um, it's taken a while to get those to market. Um, we got the permission to release those a couple years ago, and it's still at least going to be a couple years before we see them in the marketplace, which is, I can't wait to see them out there. So the breeding, that was kind of the history. Um, when we talk about breeding, um, largely what we do is traditional breeding, the Luther Burbank kind of breeding. So we have this plant with a trait we like, we have this plant with a trait we like, and what we have to do is have a plant here with each of those individual traits. So we cross those parents, look at them, hope we can recover that trait in a plant that's meritorious and better than anything that's on the market. Using characterized parents in a recurrent phenotypic selection scheme. So basically, we look at what these plants look like and we're selecting out of our progenies. We make the cross, we have those seedlings, we're evaluating them not only for cultivar potential, but we also evaluate these seedlings for parental um, potential. So we take the data, go back through that data, and select parents based on the scorings and the ratings that we have for them. It's dependent on the existence of a well-characterized cold-hardy germplasm pool, and a lot of what we work with wouldn't fall into that category. But we do have a few things that do. Deciduous azalea, for sure. The first crosses for azalea were made in 1957, so we have a substantial germplasm pool for azaleas. Roses have been around for quite a while. We have a pretty good germplasm pool for those. Wygela is something Steve's been working with since 1999-2000. We have a pretty good, strong germplasm pool to use for this traditional kind of breeding program. I could throw some other things in there as well, but those are the main ones. The other thing that we do is germplasm evaluation. Um, so what we do is take a look at plant material and just look at it for its complete, or hopefully its complete range of traits and characters. You can start with a phone call. Um, so, probably two years after I got here, my phone rang. I was talking to a woman from way western Minnesota. I can't even remember where. It was out on the border of South Dakota. And she was describing to me this little bush, this little shrub that had these small apples on it and wanted to know if I could identify it. Asked her to send me a picture, um, suspecting that it might be flowering quince. She sent it, and indeed, it was flowering quince. So I emailed her back and asked her if she'd be willing to send me these fruits that I'd like to grow the seed and take a look at them. She said, fine, and sent a box of them. And that started this little adventure. Um, this isn't the picture. I wish I still had the picture, but I don't. But it largely looked like this. And I'll come back to this in just a couple minutes. Generally, though, when we do germplasm evaluations, we're looking at seed that's sourced from the northernmost populations of something, the northernmost individual of something that doesn't typically grow here. Sometimes we'll find these plants right in the Twin Cities, a real oddball plant that rarely or ever is seen here. Or we go south, west, sometimes um, foreign sources, things that we can document 
you know, the coldest things that we could find. And basically, we're looking for outliers, things that are just cold, more cold hardy on average than the taxa is. And that's kind of the modus operandi for this germplasm evaluation, or the first cut that we have when we do this. Can result in direct cultivar selection. We can sometimes, looking at seedlings, find things right off the bat that have cultivar quality, and we're looking at them with the potential for releasing them. Usually, though, um, what we're doing is looking for parents in this material. And we may be crossing the most cold hardy of the lot to already released cultivars that aren't quite cold hardy enough for us, or maybe making crosses between individuals that we see in this germplasm pool. So to jump back to the kinomalies story, um, you don't often see kinomalies around here. Um, no. There. You do occasionally see it around here. Sometimes I'll see it and I about go off the road when I see it, but not often. It's a beautiful shrub. Um, we had a plant growing right outside our dining room window as a kid. The plant's still there. I'll talk about that here in a second. Produces three quarters of an inch to an inch and a quarter, sometimes sized flowers, often in these really beautiful reds, oranges. Things I've always liked about this plant is it's a hummingbird magnet. The hummingbirds just pound this thing in the spring when it's flowering. The other thing is it produces those fruits, um, which are reported to be edible. And in fact, um, man, it was probably just a month ago on National Public Radio, I heard a story where they were talking to a woman who was talking about recipes for making jams and sauces and stuff out of these. And you could probably Google that on NPR. I think, Steve, this year we're going to harvest those fruits and make something out of them. Anyways, a neat plant that we don't see that often around here. <clears throat> what we do see here, you'll see this fairly often, is the cultivar that's grown here is something called Texas Scarlet. It is Kinomaly speciosa. It's one of the two major species, the other one being Kinomaly japonica. Um, and then there's some hybrids between them they are ex superba. I've never liked this Texas Scarlet. It's a low haystack of a plant. It's thorny. It's got kind of dull leaves. And it's not real cold hardy. Um, and you can see that here. And not that tough of a winter, we lost the top out of that thing. So what we've done is we took the seed that we got from western Minnesota. We germinated that. I went back. Actually, I didn't go back home. Um, I had my brother. This is the case where my brother sent the seed. And actually, um, as a side story, my brother's kind of a joker. So he sent the seed, and there's some other strange seed in there that Steve kept asking me about. And Steve kept saying, I don't know what it was, but it didn't germinate. And he'd ask me. Finally, one day, I remembered to ask my brother. He had taken some of those little dried strawberries out of his daughter's cereal and stuck them in there. <laughs> so, that three-year mystery was finally ended. Anyways, we grew those things um, with some other material. And actually, this is one of them. It looks great here. This is more what we're looking for, this erect, more um, kind of vase-shaped architecture that comes with japonica. The other thing is, oftentimes, what we really like are to have these nicely exposed flowers that are not obscured. Some of them are just totally obscured because the flowers come late and the foliage is expanded, so you don't really see the flowers. So that's one thing we're looking for. We're looking for good foliage quality. Unfortunately, this one suffered quite a bit of burn injury in colder winters. So we're still battling with that cold damage. But the architecture is another thing, the leaf form and the thorniness. The other thing about these um, are that they can be quite rhizomatous. And some of them sucker miserably, some of them not as badly. So it's another trait that we're battling with. Steve, how many selections do we have of those kind of anomalies now? Nine. It's a pretty new effort. I think we're just one generation into making some crosses. But a fun project that could result in something, maybe in the not too distant future. You, you've probably all seen Japanese maples. Acer Paul made them. Generally around here will grow Emperor One or Blood Good. And you'll see them in almost any garden center. We'll get a lot of calls this spring, because a lot of people are going to end up like this. This one's been pruned, but all this dead wood on it. They're marginally hardy. This winter, they're going to suffer a lot of damage. They're just not quite cold hardy for us here. But everyone wants them. Steve and I want them. A lot of things we work on because we want them in our garden. Um, we like them because they're small statured. They're relatively small footprints in a residential garden, but they have a true tree-like form without just overwhelming the house and everything else. So we're interested in this. 
So one of the things that we've done, Steve's done, I always stand around and talk about this stuff, Steve does all the work, um, is to both look at Acer pseudosiboldianum as one of several Asian maples, so this is Korean maple. It's a little bit hardier than Japanese maple. It's got its own problems, so we've looked at that, just seedlings of that straightforward. But the other thing Steve's done is made crosses, so we have these beautiful Japanese by Korean um, seedlings here. And we see we're segregating probably for some fall color, maybe some spring foliage color, form, hopefully hardiness. So these, I don't know, it's going to be two more years probably till they go in the field, huh, Steve? Yeah. Um, generally, we have to wait two, three, maybe four years to get these out in the field so they're hardy enough to get a true test. But that's another example of some of this germ plasma evaluation jumping into breeding with the plant material. I showed you those pictures of Cercis canadensis, eastern redbud. It's interesting to me, I think maybe Steve as well. Steve's from Indiana. I'm from southwestern Michigan. This is almost a weed where I'm from. I've packed a lot of these down growing on our banks. They grow anywhere a seed drops. They'll grow in southwest Michigan. Here it's a little tougher, but we have this Minnesota strain that grows pretty well here and has been a real nice addition to the landscape palette in this part of the world. Interestingly enough, there's a lot more variation to red buds than we see in this part of the world. This is just one example, but this is forest pansy, and it has this deep red leaf color. It fades a bit, particularly in hot weather it'll fade, but it's got a nice dark foliage to it. It's a really beautiful thing. Um, there's another one called Kobe that's a weeping form, so it's kind of a pendulant weeping form. Um, Oklahoma is a really glossy leafed form. So what we've done, um, is Steve has made crosses with these guys to our Minnesota Hardy, our Minnesota strain. So this is an example of that. Um, down here to the left, we've got Minnesota strain by Forest Pansy, that dark leaf type. So these are F1's first generation crosses, and you can see, not so well here, but in the seedling trays, these definitely have more anthocyanin than the leaves. We see others that don't. So we see some segregation there. Obviously, we're not gonna recover those traits that we want, the weeping, glossy leaf or dark leaf in this first generation. So this is gonna be kind of a long process. We've taken, again, Steve, took a bunch of these down to Ames, Iowa, thinking we'd have a little milder climate down there and planted them out, some of these F1 hybrids, so we could get them to flowering stage and make some crosses. Unfortunately, Steve told me the day before yesterday that they've had minus 26 or something down in Ames, so I think maybe, well, maybe not but they're probably gonna be dead to the snow line. Um, so that's gonna be a setback for us. But the hope then would be to submate these things and then recover some of these traits, these foliage traits, form traits we are looking for. How many of you are familiar with Sambucus elderberry? You've seen these around. One of my favorites is Sambucus canadensis. This one flowers a little later than pubins that you'll see a lot in the landscapes, but it's kind of a wetland plant, and you'll see it, it just glows. It jumps out of the landscape, really bright white flowers. If you have to stop to think about it, um, a lot of the things we call white are not really white flowers, so I'm really attracted to things that are bright white, and this is one of them. Sambucus can be kind of weedy, um, native shrub, 5 to 12 feet, kind of variable, depending on what kind of circumstance it's growing in. Good and hardy, zone 3 to 4. Naturalizes in wet margins, but it can grow in drier areas. can grow in shade or sun. Prefers sun, but it needs to be in a good moist site to be in the full sun. Interestingly enough, there are some forms of this out there, and one of the most interesting are some of these black leaf forms. And this one, in particular, black lace, has this kind of filigreed foliage in this real dark form. Unfortunately, it's zone five, six hardy. It'd be great to have in the landscape. So what we decided to do was make some hybridizations with that. And this has been kind of a fun project. It's kind of a quick, rewarding thing. These things just grow like weeds. Um, so they segregated really nicely just for the leaf trait in the first generation. Um, so we've got these, um, I don't know when you took these pictures, Steve, but I think within a couple weeks, they'd like quadruple, like these things touch the ceiling just about now. They grow so fast. I think we'll be able to make crosses on these maybe even this summer. So it's a pretty rewarding thing. Again, um, we've pulled these guys out. We're sure those are hybrids. And um, 
make some sibmates or back cross those to black lace and hopefully recover some of those dark foliage ones and then see if we've got any hardiness that came along with it. But that could be a neat advancement as well. Clethera ulnifolia, anyone familiar with summer sweet? Are you really? Neil, you are. You come from the right part of the world. So I was vaguely familiar with this thing, okay? And we grow it here, and it limps along, and it straggles, and it struggles to get anything. I've never seen one like this up here in the upper Midwest. Um, but it's got this nice um, raceme-like flower on the, on the ends here. Um, Native maritime provinces to Florida, to Texas coast. Neil's from Vermont, and I was back there this summer in New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, and they were just everywhere in the landscape, and I found out why they call them summer sweet. I get a sense of it in our plots, but man, in the landscape, these things perfume the air like it's just unbelievable. Four to 12 feet variable. There's some fairly small cultivars on the market now. Um, not reliably hardy for us. They're, um, they range in color from white like this to just about every shade of pink to something you could almost call red, I guess, but it'd be a deep pink. Listed as zone four hardy, but rarely so or rarely completely so for us here. We see a lot of damage on them, a lot of kind of stutter start with them. They're tough to get established in the landscape. One of the reasons I keep Steve around is because he makes me laugh about once a day. And he sent me this um, this weekend. Um, he said, you know, Stan, people love bees. Bees love clethera. People are going to love clethera. <laughs> okay. And it's true, you see bees all over these things. It can sometimes be kind of scary to be around in August, but incredibly fragrant. Um, so Steve's made a lot of crosses with these. The, the progress on these is kind of slow. They're tough to get going in the landscape. The other surprising thing to us is making these dark pink by white crosses, how few pinks we recover out of these crosses. And that's um, been a little perplexing. But we've got some fairly nice selections out there. Um, now a field full of these guys right now. Hopefully we can get something remotely as vigorous as the plant materials I've, I saw on the East Coast this year, but another interesting plant material. Anybody familiar with Hinoki Falls Cypress? Alex is. Okay, um, Hinoki Falls Cypress, Camus saparis obtusa, something I, I don't remember when I first saw this plant, but I know it was in days that I had it planted at my folks' house at my childhood home, and those plants are still there on either side of the steps going onto the deck. Native Japan and Taiwan um, species um, grows to 75 feet, 100 feet in its native environment. Camisparis obtusa, um, the cultivar nana gracilis, is the one that I planted, the one you often see, six feet high by four feet wide. It's a beautiful plant with this just kind of scalloped sprays on it, just like a really elegant form of arborvitae is what it's like. Really slow growing, just a nice, nice um, plant material for a residential landscape, residential scale landscape. Problem with it is it's zone five hardy at best. Um, so what we did, this was a real simplistic approach, but we managed to source some seed from this. And I don't know how many we have, Steve, 250 to 500 of these seedlings. Um, five or 600. Did we put them all out this year? Oh, good. <laughs> this is what happens to us. A lot of times we get these things, put them out, and we have the worst weather winter ever. Um, and this, this is probably a really good example of that. But we put several hundred of those out this year. I think Steve took this picture in December, and they were still doing pretty well. But I imagine these got smashed pretty hard. I would be really thrilled if there's just one of them green and the rest are all dead. That would be a million dollar plant for sure. Um, but it's been fun working with these things. And we expect, if they survive, to see a fair bit um, of segregation for form and character in these. How many of you are fam familiar with Japanese Stwardia? Alex is. Alex, my grad student, comes from Pennsylvania. He's seen all this stuff. 
Um, my first experience with this guy was when I worked at a botanic garden in Michigan way, way back when, and I was asked to plant one of these um, by the library there. And the tree is still there, at least last time I was at Fernwood is still there. And I was pretty enchanted with it at the time, and I've seen it routinely in botanic gardens and arboreta around the world, east of here, south of here, not here. So Japanese dwarfia, it's native to Japan. Um, 20 to 40 feet at max, it's got a pyramidal form. So it's another one of these that we're endlessly looking for are these garden statured trees. These things that have a tree-like form but a small footprint that really work well in a residential landscape, don't overwhelm the house, the yard, everything else. And this one fits perfectly um, into that idiot type. Showy two to two and a half inch, June to July flowers, really if you've seen camellias, that's very camellia-like with the white petals and then the golden um, reproductive parts in the center there. Beautiful exfoliating bark, just gorgeous. So it has year-round appeal, just a nifty, nifty thing. This um, tree was out at the Holden Arboretum when we were out there a few years ago. Some people reported as zone four. We have read an account Steve's more familiar with this, that there are some trees that survived or a tree that survived up in the UP in Michigan. Um, people have messed around with this a lot, but we've not seen anything that's definitively zone four hardy, but it's a tree we would like in our garden, so we've decided to work with it. We've got some material. We source seedlings um, from a couple different places, Heritage Nursery out in Oregon. So we've got a bunch of these, some in the ground, some still in the greenhouse be interesting to see what happens to those that we've got out in the field after this winter. I talked about azaleas from this um, genus rhododendron, but I've not talked about broadleaf rhododendrons yet. And really, our project has not done a lot with these over the, over the years. So the broadleaf rhododendrons pictured over here um, are from the subgenus Hymenanthes. Um, some people refer to these as queens of the garden, and in my estimation, they sure are. It's one of the first plants I ever remember planting um, in the yard in my family home. It was also one of the quickest ones to exit. Um, I put them under a leaky gutter, and they don't like wet feet. Um, Anyways, there's been thousands, tens of thousands of cultivars named that are out there. This is a hobbyist dream, so lots of people have selected and named these things, so there are tons of them. But there's less than a dozen of them that are recommended for this part of the world, and of those, really a small handful will really grow well. And those, um, the best of that lot, are some of the cultivars developed at the University of Helsinki. Probably one of the best ones is this cultivar, Haga that was developed there. Interestingly enough, when we look at this in our environment, one of the things that it does um, is this bypassing trait. And we had a grad student in the project that worked on this a few years ago. I thought it was gonna be a pretty straightforward project. Ended up being one of the messier projects we've ever gotten involved in in terms of solving it. But by bypassing, I mean, just as the flowers are starting to open, we see the vegetative growth come and it basically obscures the flower show. So it's kind of a poor quality rhododendron. Even though it's cold hardy, has a nice compact form. It's really not as showy as some of them out there. So my same student, Lacey, who was working on this project that was really tough to do, part of the project she was doing at the Holden Arboretum um, east of Cleveland with a friend of mine and a collaborator, Dr. Steve Krebs, and he runs a rhododendron breeding program there. So on the side, in the evenings, on the weekends, I had Lacey, she took some haga pollen out there with her and put it on a lot of really colorful um, rhododendrons out there. Um, uh, boy, I'm not even dredging up some of these names. Um, purple ones, dark red ones. We were looking for ones with a lot of pigment because ours tend to be pink. The really cold hardy ones just tend to be kind of a bland pink. Seems to be the same with the roses too. The cold hardy roses just tend to be pink. We want yellows, oranges, reds, purples, and all these other things. So basically, we cross colorful by Haga and have developed some really nice seedlings that are way bigger than seedlings and need to find a home out in the field this spring or we're going to be in trouble. But 
I'm really excited to see that. I don't expect to see those flower for a couple more years, but we really hope maybe we have recovered some good color in some of these and can move that little side project along. Okay, so that's kind of the breeding. Some of the things are going on, you get a sense kind of how we go about that. Some of them are pretty straightforward. Some of them are kind of shots in the dark and grabbing things from out here and pulling them in and see what we can make of them. Ends up being a lot of fun. Um, in terms of supporting genetics and physiology, I'm just going to talk about a couple of the kind of the newer things that we're doing. There's been a number of projects during the year that, uh, during the years that we're not pursuing actively right now. But one of them involves deciduous native azaleas, deciduous azaleas um, that are native here to North America. Some of you have been around here long enough that remember me standing up in front here giving a seminar, an interview seminar, and one of the things I said I wanted to do was work with these native azaleas and use them for breeding and find some with better traits. Um, it's taken me 13 years, but we've finally gotten around to that. And this is a project that Alex Sesco is working on. So there's 17 species of deciduous azaleas native to the U.S. We are, we're the pauperate for many plants in terms of genetic diversity and all. This is one that we really have a huge amount of, of germplasm for. North American native um, azaleas have been important parts of European gardens six, since the 1680s when they were first reported as being there, plants that were pretty quickly hauled back to Europe and distributed in the gardens. Just as importantly as being grown in, in and of themselves in the garden, they've been used for breeding. And in fact, most of the deciduous azalea cultivars available today um, have our half, um, or at least part, North American um, in, their, in their pedigrees. And I could go on and on about that. Despite this long-standing acquaintance with these native deciduous azaleas, really no systematic effort has been made to characterize this germplasm or understand it or look at it. Basically, nobody's gone out and just gotten a whole bunch of any one of these species and put it in a common site and evaluated looked at it to see what the complete range of traits are um, over the whole germplasm. And this is something that we would do routinely with maize or soybean or something like that. But it's not been done with these. In all likelihood, the best genotypes of these various traits have not been used in breeding programs. Okay? And I think it's an important thing we ought to do. I've got to say this. Um, this thinking is not, um, it's not mine. When I was in grad school, my major advisor, Jim Hancock, was working on a project that kind of had its genesis while I was there. He was working with Jim Luby, and they were working on the strawberries. Basically, their idea was to do what Jim called reconstitute the strawberry genome. So they wanted to find the best Fregaria chilowensis, the best Fregaria virginiana, and cross those instead of just using random ones like happened in a French botanic garden, which was the origin um, of cultivated strawberry. Probably the same thing happened here. My predecessors got their hands on one um, rhododendron viscosum, one rhododendron calendulaceum that would kind of survive, would flower, have some pollen, they'd use it in a cross, and that was kind of the extent of the use of rhododendron calendulaceum or rhododendron viscosum. And what I want to do, and what we're going to start doing, is look for better of these various species and utilize them. So I hired Alex Sesco on as a grad student. He started this fall, and he decided to work with rhododendron viscosum, which is a swamp azalea, to begin this process. So viscosum um, has a range from the, the coastal Texas here, and it goes all the way up the seaboard, up into Maine. Populations at some elevation down, maybe even into the Piedmont area. Um, so we expect there may be some populations that are more, more cold hardy, some less. Um, we're looking for a lot of variation in traits. We know that these will flower at different times. We expect maybe there'll be some differences in pH tolerance. Um, but what we want to do is sample across this complete range to get an idea of just the extent of variation of the various horticultural traits and tolerance traits. 
One of the things he'll be doing is characterizing genetic diversity and structuring in these adult populations. We want to see just how diverse they are, basically looking at the population genetics of these things, which is something that's not been done. Um, and then the other thing is characterize the extent of variation, like I said, for the range of horticultural traits in these seedlings. And one thing we know for sure um, is there's some variation in flower color. So basically it would be described as a white flowering azalea, but there are pinks. We don't know how dark a pink they'll become. One important thing, one fairly simple thing for our project is we've got these 16 um, light deciduous azaleas. All of them bloom from the third week in May till about the second week of June, and that's it. But we know these azaleas, some of these species, maybe even viscosum itself, this being a later flowering one, um, will flower into August. So we could develop cultivars that bloom a lot later than the ones we have up here now by judicious choice of parents. And we've documented some of that with some crosses we've made just with some viscosum that we have on hand as it is. The first trait, though, that Alex is going to look at in the course of his work is pH tolerance. So these rhododendrons are ericaceous plants, ericaceous plants like cranberries, like blueberries, like a number um, of woody ornamental plants, including the rhododendrons, um, basically characterized by a need to grow in low pH soil. The pH in the soil gets up above 5.5, five, these things start suffering. They just really won't grow on a pH of 7 um, well at all. The other thing is they like a quick draining, highly organic kind of soil. So Alex, a couple years, was it two summers ago, Alex? Um, got here to the university and pretty quickly came in my office and expressed an interest in working with woody plants. So we settled on working on this pH thing. And we started with um, broadleaf rhododendrons. There'd been some reports I'd been reading for a number of years ago, a number of years about these Incaro rootstocks that were developed in Germany. They were developed as rootstocks and supposedly they had tolerance to elevated pH. So I was interested in those. We finally, my time spent in Germany, all I located, found out where I could get these plants. So we got some Encaros in. We got some Encaros that had a, a cyan grafted on top of them, and then we got just some straightforward Hagas, which is the one that grows the best around here. And Alex set up these nice experiments um, where we potted them all up and then did different treatments, pH treatments with them with the watering and all. And despite a lot of hard work and effort with these things, we didn't find any significant differences. Um, he looked at chlorophyll um, content. We looked at the quality of the leaves, a number of different things. We saw things that suggested these Encaros maybe were more pH tolerant, but we didn't get any significant differences in our data, which is often typical. We surmised that the problem was these big root balls just had a lot of buffering capacity. And for the short period of time we were looking at these, we just weren't going to see the responses we wanted. Um, yeah, so that was the end of summer one. Alex came back the next summer and developed, did a lot of thinking about this, and developed some in vitro um, approaches. So he got some good tissue culture skills, got some material, actually some haga by Encaro seedlings established in vitro, and has done some work with those last year and developed some systems. Subsequently decided to come in and work on the azalea project, so this will have a nice spin-off into looking at azaleas when we start collecting that germplasm material. Anyways, we've got plants in culture right now that we can work with, clean plants, nice, easy to manipulate system here, easier to control variables and everything else. Um, and what I'm going to show you now is just some work that Alex has been doing in just the last couple, three weeks with a couple of undergrad students. One of the things that he's developed that I, I, has just been a lot of fun looking at here, um, well, let me go back. We could just go forward really straightforward, take those seedlings, germinate them, put them in different soil regimes and different pHs. As a plant breeder, that would be good enough for me. If I found some that survived at 7.0, I would grab those, make crosses, run, and I'd be happy. But Alex is interested in why these things won't grow in elevated pH soil or vice versa, why one might. So he's trying to set up some systems um, to get to the heart of that. Can rhododendrons and azaleas adapt to elevated pH soils? So what he's done is taken some of these tissue culture plants and put them in media with phenol red, which is a colorimetric indicator um, for pH. 
Okay. And what we want to do is see if we can visualize root influence on the media. Basically, there are some plants, there are some systems of Arabidopsis and wheat where they have documented the rhizosphere influence and pumping hydrogen ions into that rhizosphere to change the pH there. So, Alex put, had 20 in this initial array. And um, so the 20 plants are listed here, these little squares, so one through 20 here. And at week zero, he set up a camera and took a picture right through those tubes of each one of those 20. So he set up a camera, had the same settings on the camera, put it in the same distance, um, and got these, then clipped that little square out of the picture. Subsequently did the same thing at week one and week two for each of these 20. And this is just a sum total of all those color blots. Left to right picture taken at subculturing one and two weeks later. And what we're seeing here is a change um, in the color of the media over the course of three weeks. Um, so they're all basically the same color here to begin with. And then you can see various changes. All of them, um, the pH started at 7, 8. And so it's a magenta color. As the media pH changes, the color changes. So at pH 7, 0, you get a red, and that might be something like that. 6, 0 for orange might be that. And then yellow for 5, 4. I don't know if that's quite the yellow that would be 5, 4, but you get the idea. Um, Alex and Josh Friel, um, one of the TERF students, uh, have been working together to develop a MATLAB program to analyze these color images. Okay. So basically what they've done is they're attaching numeric values for saturation hue and something called value, which is kind of the light and the dark. So the color quality within these squares. So all we can do now is do some statistics with these things. Um, so again, this is two weeks, or just a couple, three weeks that they've been at this, but pretty neat. The colors here suggest the potential that we are seeing genotypic variation for the influence of that root on the media there, which is hopeful for us in terms of thinking that there is a genetic trait here that we can work with in breeding. The other thing he's done, um, which is equally interesting, um, is using ferrazine um, to measure um, iron 2 plus, or available iron, or reduced iron in the media. Um, the more reduced iron, this iron 2 plus, um, in the media, um, the more purple color. So you can see down here, we have more reduced iron in here as compared to here. Top rhododendron zealing, um, again, is at pH 7, 8, right here. And then down below is 5, 7. Oops, I'm getting carried away here. So 5, 7, lower pH, more purple. The question here was, does the plan have any effect on this process? Well, I just sat down with a lab group, and Alex um, did some further experiments. And it looks like um, when he reran this experiment, um, we didn't have a control with no plant in it. But Alex suspected that maybe this was irrespective of the plant. Sure enough, when we, he reran the experiment this week and did the two pH treatments, and then a jar or a tube with no plant in it, all of them changed to some degree. So there's something going on just in the chemistry of the media that's reducing iron and affecting that color change. Although at the lower pH media, you do see a quicker change. So I don't know where we'll go with this particular experiment, but it's a pretty fun thing that he's brought in here, um, working with this again to get at more of the mechanism for um, this need for reduced pH soils for these ericaceous plants. And then um, I need to thank Mitchell Peterson, a Europe student, and Elsa Eschnauer, um, a directed study, study student, have been working with Alex on this, learning the sterile technique and, and working with all these things. Some of you know that we've worked for quite a while, pretty much since the beginning with rose black spot disease. It's one of the big projects that's just been kind of ongoing um, in our project. A former graduate student, Vance Whitaker, did some great work on this PATHA system. Um, it's a gene for gene kind of system. Um, so we've got a gene for resistance in the rose. We've got a virulence gene in the pathogen. And these end up being kind of this escalating um, mutation for mutation, almost arms race. 
Vance identified three races of the pathogen in North America. It was one of the first things he did um, for his master's degree. Um, subsequently went on and we managed to get all the known um, characterized races around the world that were in freezers and preserved and brought them over here, ran them across a, a standard host array and were able to differentiate 11 out of all these around the world and gave them a standard nomenclature, which was a big advancement. And then he characterized a new rose black spot resistance gene, RDR3, that conferred resistance to race 8 and then developed a scar marker that was linked to that gene that we hoped would be useful for breeding for resistance to rose black spot. Subsequent work done by a, a former grad student, Andrea Clark, and then Dr. David Zlezak, who is one of our former graduate students here, um, revealed that the marker did not always amplify a band in more diverse radius 8 resistant roses. So in these test populations, this marker worked real well. When we went out into a broader array of germ plasm like we'd work with in a breeding program or somebody else would work with in a breeding program, the band wasn't, or the marker wasn't always robust or diagnostic. Wasn't really surprising um, in that we estimated that marker was 9.1 centimorgans from the gene. So that would would have been surprising if it had held up. So right now we're in the process. This project has kind of been just idling along as a side project, um, being worked on a little bit in the summer. But we're working with a consortium of fellow breeders and researchers to write a second generation Ross breed proposal. You've heard Jim Luby talk about Ross breed, and we've had several students trained in his program with Ross breed. So um, putting another one together, it's got more of an emphasis on disease resistance and in fruit quality. Um, so we are participating with that. We want to develop more robust markers to these two described resistance genes, RDR1, which is described in Germany, and then RDR3 that we describe. But we want markers that are tightly linked that can be used by breeders routinely for marker-assisted selection, marker-assisted breeding. Um, the other thing is we're, we're also interested in additional gene discovery. We've got those nine other races out there. There's going to be some resistance genes for those, so we want to do some more gene discovery characterization, develop markers for those additional race or resistance genes for use in marker assisted breeding and selection. Okay, so the new project, which was just kind of dreamed up not too long ago, um, is a conservation project. And I give a lot of credit for this to Steve McNamara. He's the one that thought about um, hemlock, Suva Canada, and says, it's a tree that grows around here. How many of you are familiar with Canada hemlock? A few of you are. It's a beautiful tree, another one of my favorites. Um, I've planted a lot of these in my yard up here that have died. Um, it's a native North America conifer, 40 to 100 feet um, in its natural environment. Naturally occurs in mixed hardwood conifer stands Typically um, in moist, well-drained, cool sites in ravines is where you'll find it. It's actually a climax forest species in this part of the world, um, so it's the end of the succession in a forest stand. Very shade tolerant, long-lived, um, slow-growing, nifty tree. The distribution is in um, eastern North America here, in the Appalachians, um, the Smoky Mountains, and the upper Midwest here into the Ozarks a bit is where it's found in its native distribution up a bit into Canada there as well. In Minnesota, it's historically been found, been reported in all the, the herbacea or the, the plant surveys from back in the 1890s on. Um, native to Minnesota, although never common, and you can see just a few shaded areas where it has been reported historically. After the logging era and other human alterations of the environment, it's now one of Minnesota's rarest and most endangered trees. Um, so it presents kind of a unique opportunity. Currently 10 sites within the state are known to contain trees, and those are scattered in these locations. And there's only 50, about 50 mature trees that are capable of reproduction in those sites. And little to no natural reproduction occurs. They will produce some seed, but there's no recruitment. The deer love these things. Um, they don't like droughty kind of situations. We've had a lot of that in recent years, these hot, dry spells at the end of the summer, which is really tough on these seedlings. 
At the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, we have mature trees that were derived from seed collected at one of the largest populations that existed in the state, and that was up by Lake Mille Lacs. And after the seed was collected at some point, that population was wiped out. And I can't remember how that happened, if it was a fire or just what happened. That native population is no longer there, but we have trees now that are reproductive that were collected there. So that um, presents another interesting opportunity for research. Interestingly enough, Canada hemlock's also a very versatile landscape plant material. So it's of great interest, not only as a conservation natural plant thing, but also as a thing of commerce. Grows in sun and shade equally well if it has enough soil moisture, it needs that. Slow growing can be managed as a small tree in residential landscapes. I tell my students, this is a tree, even though it will get 100 feet tall at some point, really won't be your problem. This is one you could plant right by the corner of your house and manage as a small tree. It'll be somebody else's problem as it starts to overgrow the house. But it could be managed for a long, long time as a small tree, probably as long as you wanted to. Um, in fact, they can be severely hedged like this into very formal hedges in sun or shade. One of the few plants that can do that. It's another thing that makes it so meritorious as a landscape plant material. So our intention here, um, we're working collaboratively with the Arboretum, with Pete Moe, um, with the new conservation people we have out there um, on this project. And our goals, the project is to evaluate genetic diversity in the remaining trees. So we want to look at these mature trees that stand on the landscape in Minnesota, see what they look like genetically um, with molecular marker systems, and we've yet to determine that. Um, but see what's out there. Then look at what we've got in our population that came from that Mille Lacs population, see how those compare. Then obviously look at the seedlings that we get off of those trees and see what the diversity in those seedlings looks like compared to the parents and just how, what the risk is for inbreeding and stuff like that in the material we have left. Right, evaluate genetic diversity in the seedlings from those extirpated populations. And then down the road, it would be really neat to work with the Minnesota landscape, nursery industry, the U.S. landscape nursery industry to develop a means to propagate these plants, these hemlocks, sell them, distribute them in a way that would maintain and or maybe elevate, expand the genetic diversity in these materials going forward. So it's a project that we're working on putting together as we speak. I came here 13 years ago just thinking how to wind this up, and I had to pay homage to this. I, I worked at the, for the ARS. I was a strawberry breeder. I had a nice program and all. The thing that was missing is I didn't work with students, and that I just couldn't imagine going through my whole life. And um, so I was lucky enough to come here. And so I really thank these guys. These are my past students, and I won't go through them all, but they brought us to the point here, done some great work. And some of the work they're doing, we're building on in these projects I'm talking about now. And I owe them a big debt of gratitude to bring us here so successfully. And then a big list of people that are working currently with us here. And rather than go through all that and get all emotional or something, I'll leave it at that. But I talk about the work these guys do it all is the way it always seems to work out. So that's what I've got for you today, and I'll try to answer questions if you have any.